On the 28th of December 1978, a DC-8 aircraft belonging to United Airlines was approaching Portland, Oregon. It was early evening. For the crew on flight 173, a perfectly routine journey from New York was nearly over. As the aircraft descended through 8,000 feet, the first officer who was flying the leg requested the wing flaps be extended to 15 degrees to start the final approach. The captain complied. Then they lowered the landing gear. But as the captain did so, they heard a loud thump. And the aircraft yawed slightly. And while the nose wheel appeared to be properly down, they got a red light indicating problems with the main landing gear. Portland Control asked the co-pilot to put the aircraft into a holding pattern south of the airport while they sorted the problem out. For the next 30 minutes, the crew discussed among themselves all the emergency and precautionary actions available to them to decide whether the gear was down or not. Then the captain got onto United's Technical Control Center in San Francisco. Control agreed they'd done everything they could. The likelihood was that the gear was safe. They might as well attempt the landing. The captain agreed. He checked with the flight engineer. There was 7,000 pounds of fuel left. That's good ballpark, he said. We want to get everybody ready, and then we'll go. It's as clear as a bell, and no problem. Yet 30 minutes later, that aircraft crashed here in a wood, eight miles south of the airport. Worse still, for United, it was only one of a spate of three crashes. And in each case, the official report blamed pilot error. But that was only naming the problem. No one actually knew what pilot error meant. It was as if the airline had been hit by an epidemic of a new disease, and no one knew enough to cure it. What I'd like to do this morning is very briefly examine the coper possessed by each one in the occupation of aviation who is A, going to last, and B, be successful and safe. Now, what is a coper? Well, a coper is sort of like your resistance. Well, where the hell is that? Nobody knows. Well, we know what happens when it's not there, okay? The coper is the same way. But I can identify for you and quantify what to me as a practicing flight surgeon the three features of an intact coper are. And to me these are so celluloid that through my professional glasses as I look at you, my patients and my colleagues, I mentally tick off the checklist of one, two, three. Are they there? Are they being properly balanced? Are they being correctly orchestrated so that they all work, are all present and none compromised at any one time? If all three are there and they are like that, I can rest easy, you've got your stuff together. Now you can make mistakes, and you can do dumb things, and we're going to hear some about that this morning. And all just because you have an intact coper doesn't mean you always will survive. But if you do not have an intact coper, you will not survive, and that's where its utility comes. Now I would say, let me first of all tell you what the three things are, and then let's look at them. Number one, and the one that you spend we spend most of our energies doing is being in control. How simple. Being in control of everything about my life, the people who interface with me. Look at me in my airplane as I move those control surfaces. That bird does just what I want for just as long as you bet your life. That's me in control. But using me in my airplane is symbolic because I'm doing that with every single thing in my life so that, A, I make things happen, and B, there'll be no surprises. Now, there's a corollary to that, and we'll get to this also shortly. The corollary is this, and see if you've heard this one before. If you can't be in control, at least make it look like you are. Item number two in the culprit to be dissected this morning is something that comes as a surprise to the aviator, but not at all 
to his wife. And that is that he builds in calculated emotional distance into his relationships. He doesn't know whether to should or go blind when it comes to intimacy and its big troubles because what we're going to look here this morning is that we're talking about occupationally based copers that are then transmitted into the home where they fall flat on their face. The third feature of this intact coper is a mind trick that all of us probably picked up before we were age 26, which I see in the Navy's training command, young student pilots struggling to figure this out, and all, even I'll just drop the word on them, and it helps to crystallize things, and the word is compartmentalization. You must have your life so organized and structured so that you have separate, clearly identifiable missions, and that when you put your attention to any given mission, you are not distracted by any other. All right, let's take a look at the business of being in control. There are certain people whose, whose lives, predictably, before controlling ever becomes an issue, are going to be interested in having this happen to them. And it turns out it's an accident of birth. Demographically, one of three males is the oldest son. Would you please show me by a raise of the hands in this room this morning, how many in this room are oldest sons? Would you raise your hands for me, please? Hold your hands up, please. Ladies and gentlemen, would you look around and see if this looks to you like one out of three? On the contrary, for the television audience, it's at least two out of three and possibly seven out of ten. All right, what is that telling us? It tells us that the aviation community has already been self-selected and that there is something peculiar about oldest sons that are drawn to aval naval aviation, not naval, but aviation. And the reason is, we are adventurers, we're competitive as hell, and we like to do difficult tasks and do them well. And I dare say anybody who flew into Dallas yesterday knows what a difficult task is. The oldest son, who is going to make his mind up that doing difficult tasks is a good thing for him, and he would groove on this, probably before age five, as many of us who are also fathers know, getting lots of not very subtle encouragement from father that you better get out there and do some real neat stuff if you expect some recognition out of me. So what happens? Sonny goes out and busts his tail to get dad's recognition. And does he get it? No. What happens? I'll tell you what happens. When you come home from St. Thomas the Apostle School in West Hartford and you got nine A's and one B from Sister Mary Holy Water and that's really something I scream about, what happens to you? You get a ration of shit for the B and nobody sees the A's. <laughs> for two weeks, there's consternation in the house. All right? What happens then is very critical, and this explains how the, the uh, one of the three in this room who did not make the cut ended up in this room. <laughs> it's this. Around age five or six, you are forced into a decision when you finally figure out that you cannot please that SOB no matter how hard you try. Therefore, either you quit, in which case you peel off and in essence become some sort of a society dropout. For instance, if you're the second son in the house, your oldest brother is either an artist or a dirtbag. <laughs> He quit and left it to you, number two son. <laughs> or, as two out of three in this room did, they said, to hell with you, Father, I want to do that because I like it. Each of us, in our own term, then becomes our man. And we do it because we like it, and we set out on what turns out to be, if you want to look back and see, a very impressive dossier of the things that the oldest son has done as he experiments with trying to get control of things and make things happen and get really neat vibes. Because if you were to look at the curriculum vitae of any person in this room starting around age five and going on, watch this. When the kids in the neighborhood used to play commando, who was the colonel? You were. You were the guy who probably your sister said, you're bossy. Yeah, you're the controller who's experimenting and getting better and better at it. You're the guy who got to school, and not only were teachers pet, 
as many of us were, but you got Dean's List and honor roll grades early on until you discovered girls and it all went to hell, but you picked up on that again later. <laughs> You're the one who was elected to school office by your peers. You're the ones who got the contact sport varsity letter. You know, you didn't collect stamps. You don't want to beat the tar of another man. The competitive in you keeps pushing you. You were the Boy Scout early on. You were the altar boy. You were the good altar boy who, when they had a dowager's funeral or some big society wedding, you were the one they wanted in that ceremony. And I remember speaking to a group of 33 instructors in Pensacola about a year and a half ago. And I asked a question that was dynamite for the answer. I said, how many of you are Eagle Scouts? Of the 33 men in the room, 22 were. They were all in tailhook aviation. So I'll tell you something about this business, this club, aviation, controlling is very important. Making things happen. Uh, let me give you a couple examples of how we do this. If you are a daddy, I dare say you treat your kids the way you treat your airplane. Measured input gets measured response now. <laughs> and if that's unfamiliar, may I point something else out to you? Let's examine the family weekend automobile trip. God help us. <laughs> you want to see Mr. Controller in his glory? Take a look at him. The night before the planned departure, where is father? He is in the den poring over the AAA maps. He knows the expected time of departure, which by the way is always zero dark 30. He knows the expected time of arrival. He knows where the detours are. Where do you pick up the interstate? What is the availability of diesel fuel for his Bavarian Motovox automobile? He knows whether there's radar traps, and somewhere around the fifth hour of this long, long trip, he also knows that, for instance, let's see, passing Lemoore at quarter past three, I should be right on the money up with me in San Diego about quarter past seven. He's got the whole thing figured out. Right. The fact that mother has a size two bladder is not his problem. <laughs> But Mr. Controller is in his glory, and when the children file into the back seat, whoosh, one swipe gets three kids, and it's crystal clear who is in control. It'll be a good day. You got that? <laughs> now, for some of you who haven't had that pleasure, let me show you the controller not in his glory, and in fact, where there is far more to be learned on how important controlling is. Let's take the same scenario of the family trip. Your cross the street neighbor, however, comes over at 8 o'clock the evening that you had mentally put aside the wicket to pass through for your planning. And comes the knock on the door. It's 8 o'clock. It's old Charlie. Charlie says, hey, Frank, come on over. I got me a couple X-rated tapes. We're going to take a look at them. Great idea. So the end result is you're off viewing the X-rated tapes, and you don't do your planning. But zero dark 30 cometh. And the little Seco bellomatic alarm in your cerebrum goes off at the duty hour, and you are up. You got the big eye. It's time to go. Where are those damn kids? Let's get this show on the road. Mother says, Daddy is in a bad mood. <laughs> Code talk. Recognition by the spouse that the controller did not pass through the planning wicket as the responsibility had been assigned, and he therefore is irritable. Not only is he irritable, would not be unjust to say he is safety wired pissed off <laughs> and will be miserable company all day long because the controller assigned himself the responsibility of control in a special and particular way and he did not meet that assignment and therefore is irritable and you can see that in your own life when a controller is irritable and he doesn't know why Take a look at what it is you think you're supposed to be controlling, but you're not, and you'll have an answer. And you can make the punishment fit the crime. Because if it's the dog, you know, forget it. But if it's the kids, give them hell. Three very important things occur to the budding controller that are going to cause him to insert emotional distance, the second piece of his coper, into how he lives. Round one in this three-round battle, which is going to be all three rounds, he's going to lose. Round one occurs as a toddler. He is still wearing huggies. And Daddy says, 
Big boys don't cry. Big boys now, mind you, are 15 months old and 21 pounds, all right? They are not allowed to cry, and the, the code talk to the kid is crystal clear. If you are masculine, you are not allowed to have feelings. Now, you may fall down on the floor and get a boo-boo on your head, and you want to sit on mama's lap and put your head in a nice, soft place, but you are going to catch hell from daddy, because that is not masculine. Big boys, don't cry. Stand on your own damn two feet like a man. All right, there's round one. He's a preschooler toddler. It's already coming home crystal clear. There's something unmasculine about feelings. Round two, also a losing round, will occur in first grade. And although I will tell you about Mary M, I can't say her name here because one of these days I'm going to run into her. In first grade, let me describe for you my collision with puppy love. And I dare say, you can recite the same scenario and simply change the names. It is the Thursday before Easter in St. Thomas the Apostle School. Sister has decided that these rotten kids who have trashed her classroom will now participate in cleaning it prior to the Easter recess. Frankie's job is as Sister reaches into these bottomless pockets that the Sisters of Mercy have and comes out with a bottle of furniture polish, my task is to clean the baseboard all the way around the room, which requires a hands and knees position, which of course I do. I'm a good little boy. As a matter of fact, I'm teacher's pet. What I haven't told you yet is Mary M. Mary M was a beautiful little girl. She had little booblets. I didn't know what they were, but I knew I liked them. <laughs> and she had shiny patent leather shoes. She had stockings that were folded down at the knees and had a little ruffle around the top of the stocking. She had a bouffant, I think probably taffeta dress. And in the 1940s, it was very stylish that she had the Shirley Temple curls. And I'll tell you, this was a dolly. And in my mind, I was conducting a full-blown affair, though I never spoke to the girl. All right? After I had finished the task on the baseboards, and I take my assigned seat, Mary M. stands up and says, Sister, sister, there is a little hand all the way around the room on the floor on the tile. Look at that, how ugly. I was crushed. My darling has done this to me in public. And I learned the hardest possible way, round two in this business about feelings with men, that if you invest feelings in another human being, they can do a number on you like nobody can. A hard lesson. Round three, losing round, occurs in high school. When you set down to do some particularly difficult task, which requires setting options on your time, and this is a long-term goal, like, for instance, being able to pass college board exams, something over and above what you normally have to do, and you discover to your horror that if you let feelings get in your way, you cannot do this important task. This is like a monkey on your back sucking the energy out of you. The resources and the capabilities that you have are not available to you. Well, what's more important? Feelings or control? Hell, I'll tell you what it is. <coughs> and it still is. Control is more important. Feelings, I can do shit. I can do without that stuff. All it does is get in my way. There are some tragic things that happen as you get mature into adult life and you decide that, I hear this, this is very sinister, that if you allow yourself the luxury of feelings, you have given someone else the handle with which to manipulate you. All of a sudden, it becomes crystal clear why the intimacy that's required in our homes to be a half-decent spouse, father, and husband we don't do well at. And yet when we enter our aircraft and close the door or close the canopy, there are no problems in my private life that are going to interfere. And that leads me to the third feature of the COPA, the business of compartmentalization, the mind trick to exclude distraction. How do you do that? When you take a look at the real things that happen in life, screwed up bank accounts, used car salesmen who are, you know, taking it to the cleaners, Illness in a family, 
How can a guy fly an A-7 off an aircraft carrier when his four-year-old daughter is in the intensive care unit with spinal meningitis? Piece of cake. He compartmentalizes out. One of the curious things about us, you see, this is absolutely necessary. You have to be able to put your feelings aside. You must compartmentalize away the fact that your bank account is Alpha Foxtrot uniform. You must be in control of things to happen so that you can tell yourself, yes, I'm going to get in this airplane, I'm going to go from point A to point B, and by God, I'll be a survivor. And I will do what has to be done, and the resources that are required, no matter what's going to be required, I'll have them. When you put a controller in a situation where his feelings will be exposed, he will respond in a universal fashion. He will eject. Let me give you the classic. And this has happened in your house, just as this has happened in mine. You come to the breakfast table at 17 minutes of the hour. Your mission this morning is to A, finish the newspaper, B, have your second cup of coffee, and if you're a smoker, C, have your second cigarette. There is approximately 13 minutes available to complete this mission. You take your assigned seat at the throne, your chair, and the king now holds court. Becoming aware within 60 seconds that there is a curious frigidity in the kitchen this morning. Clearly, you are about to be accused of some heinous crime and retribution will be forthcoming forthwith in your castle. Oh, wait a minute. If you're going to be in control, and if you're going to prevent an assault on your feelings, which is exactly what she wants to do, and she'd like to open up these compartments and say, what is this jazz? Are you going to allow this to happen? No. What does Mr. Smooth do? Mr. Smooth brings his coffee cup on the table at 12 G's, kicks a chair out from behind him, exit stage right, get to his automobile, and drive to work 11 minutes early, and the problem is solved. <laughs> and she is there. <laughs> I don't goddamn believe this guy. <laughs> See, you think it's solved, uh, but she's got eight hours and 45 minutes for planned retribution for later. You're going to get it. Don't you worry. There are a couple little autopilot tricks that we use to keep our copers up on top and on the step to where you don't always have to keep paying attention. And the longer we're around and we use these mechanisms, the more comfortable we get with them and the more effective they are. Some of them are pretty cool. And some of them are a trap. The trap that you need to be aware of in aviation is the trap of the ritual. How many times do you have to pre-flight your airplane which is, in fact, a ritual performed and or recited the exact same way every time necessarily so you maintain control of the situation. But after a while, you get to where, hear this, you can perform that ritual with a cerebral disconnect. And in fact, you do. Nobody in this place would dare get into an airplane without having performed the ritual, even though the ritual may be utterly without significance. Let me give you a neat, for instance. You could have heard this here yesterday. The voice on the phone says, on course, on glide path, check wheels down and locked. Piece of cake. That requires a ritual response, which, of course, we will readily spit out. Where does it say you're supposed to look? You simply recite the ritual, and you are going to get burned. Let me pass a neat one to you. This happened at the Naval Postgraduate School about three weeks ago. I was doing a flight physical on an F-14 Rio. This is the backseat guy, lieutenant commander type, the all-American boy. He had just handed me the physical questionnaire. He said, there's no symptoms of any kind. Two pages filled with no, 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 no. And I say, oh, you don't have vision in both eyes, eh, asshole? <laughs> So I said, would you please step behind that screen over there and strip down, and uh, we'll be uh, doing this exam here shortly. So he announces he's ready. I go back, and I do all the things I'm supposed to do, and I finally get to the point where I'm going to check him for a hernia. So as I kneel down in front of him, and I come with the threatening, long, icy finger, okay? What does the ritual require that I say? The 
the ritual requires that I say, cough. What I say is, give me your wallet. And he goes, <laughs> The one thing that our, our coper is attempting to keep us out of is the arena where we always fall on our face, and that's the arena of spontaneity. Now, this is very important because most of us in this room, if we were to be viewed at a cocktail party, we are absolute zenith of spontaneity. Why, just charming these ladies one after the other with spontaneous, wonderful stories. How does he do this? Hey, wait a minute. That's not the way it is at all. When I talk to HS-8, the helicopter squadron on USS Kitty Hawk, the squadron was deployed with the ship, and I spoke to the wives. And I've described, roughly as I've described to you, what this guy's like. He's a controller, and there's emotional distance, and the one thing he does not possess is spontaneity. So one of them comes up to me, apparently has a size 2 hat and a D cup. <laughs> she says, uh, Oh, Dr. Dully, you're not describing my husband. Why, right off the top of his head, he does these wonderful things. In my most competent clinical tones, I said, Dear, how long have you been married? Eight months. I see. Well, what you're looking at, dear, is naval aviation spontaneity, real one. You think when he's through with real one, he's going to put on real two. There is no real two. <laughs> And if you don't think so, you ask any wife, she will tell you it is the same old stuff over and over and over. And that's as spontaneous as he gets. I'd like to leave it at that for now, and we can pick on with this later. I think much of what I've just had to say in terms of what the coper is, from whence cometh, why do we do it, how it is that we become almost the better pilot you are, you are almost guaranteed being a lousier spouse because we transpose the occupationally based coper into the home. I better tell you one more thing. I made this point to an F-4 squadron in Kaneohe, Hawaii. The safety officer of the squadron, a very thoughtful young Marine major, was very impacted by the message he heard. And in effect, did an inventory of how he conducted his life. He had a dolly of a wife, and I will attest to that, and two beautiful little girls, age four and six. And he begins to reflect on how much time he spends in his F-4, why it is that every time there's a long weekend when he can be with the family, he's on a cross country, and this business of uh, how many deployments to Iwakuni and USS Boat, and that that's a hell of a way to be a father. So what he did was he reassembled his life priorities to become a better father, to become a better husband. Guess what he got? She left him, ran off with an F-14 driver. <laughs> he backed out of Marine Corps aviation and is left with nothing. So what I'm presenting you here is Catch-22, your occupationally based coper, which you screw up every time you put in the home, but don't change it. Because if you do, there will be no more annual legends. There will be nobody out there. Thank you very much. Several years ago, there was a study done at uh, a major air carrier where um, the pilots or the captains uh, in these particular simulator runs were asked to pretend that they were incapacitated, and they did it very subtly. They didn't slump over and scream and say that you know, uh, act like they were dying essentially, but they sort of slumped over at the controls. In that simulator, in that simulator study, approximately 25% of the aircraft hit the ground because for some reason the co-pilots didn't take control. That check is done down to the uh, airspeed box. Uh, we can witness the fatal combination of the macho type and the non-assertive type in this training film. It's a reconstruction in a simulator using voice transcripts from a serious accident that actually happened to a major airline. Here comes the slope.
Watch out for the way the flight engineer in the seat nearest us and the captain, John, on the left, gang up on the young co-pilot in the front right. They're just about to begin their final okay, descent. Gate 17. Maybe gate 17, John. Oh, good. That's right, by that little snack bar. Yeah, good gate. Yeah, good well, gate. We've got about a half hour on the ground. We can uh, run in there, get something to eat, get the weather, and be on our way to Seattle. Good. Well, the glide slope there, John. Yeah, well, we know where we are out here. We're all right. Oh, you waited. The Fox is going to have it wired. I hope so. Right in. No problem. This is a little faster than you normally fly this, John? Oh, yeah, but it's nice and smooth. We're going to get in right on time, maybe a little bit ahead of time. We got it made. Sure hope so. You know, John, you know the difference between a, a duck and a co-pilot? What is the difference? Well, a duck can fly. Well said. Seems like there's a little bit of a tailwind up here, John. Yeah, we're saving gas. Help us get in a couple minutes early, too. In fact, they're less than eight miles out, going 40 knots too fast and 200 feet too low. John, you're just a little bit below the MDA here. Yeah, well, we'll take care of it here. The captain's answer to being too low is to casually leapfrog the aircraft up over the glide slope in a last-minute attempt to correct. It's a fatal maneuver. Going just a little bit high. Well, gear down. Final check. No smoking signs. It's on. Flight and nav instruments. There, toss checked. Two degrees. Uh, landing gear. It's down, three green. Speed brakes. Look awful high, John. Uh, Speed five breaks. degrees. Five degrees. Fifteen degrees. 15. Twenty-five on the flaps. Twenty-five. Well, John, you're really high. You're going to need flaps. forty, is what you need here. Get the speed brakes in. Get this thing down. They're uh, they're armed. You want the speed brakes on? I don't think you're going to make it, John, if you don't get this sucker on the ground. Get it on, John. You're not going to make there we it. Go. You're not gonna make it. Oh, we're going around. Oh, uh, damn. 140, 130 knots. Look at stop, John. You're not gonna make it, John. Great, John. I told you. Jeez. Well, look, Mr. Flores, I mean, after all, if you're in a ballpark, they always sell peanuts and popcorns and things like that. I know that, Sebastian, but not in front of them. I beg, I beg your pardon, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, and also the children, will you excuse me for a minute, please? Thank you. What do you want to do? Look, Mr. Flores. Right. What are you doing? I love baseball. Well, we all love baseball. When we get to St. Louis, will you tell me the guys' names on the team so I go to see them in that St. Louis ballpark? I'll be able to know those fellas. Well, now, it's all right, folks. All right. Excuse me. All right. I'm going to find out the fellow's name. As long as it's okay with the audience. I'm crazy about baseball. Uh, will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Okay. Now, look. Then you'll go and pedal your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore. Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames. Pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Funny ain't in that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. 
And why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> After all, the man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, what I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no, no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm about. not changing nobody. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Broadhurst? Hey, now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third, third base. Woo! You got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? Stay out of the infield! Don't mention their names out here. I want to know what's the fella's name on left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third base! Oh, take it easy. Take it easy, man. And the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. He said, will you pick up your hat, please? Pick up your hat and Whoa. stop this. Oh, look, Mr. Broadhurst. Yes. Wait a minute. You got a pitcher on a team? Wouldn't this be a fine team without a pitcher? I don't know. Tell me the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me today? I'm telling you, man. And go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow you're going to tell me who's pitching? Now listen. Who is not pitching? Who is on? I'll break the all around. You say who's on first? Why, come up here and ask. I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know. The there is. You got a catcher? Yes. The catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitching. Now you've got it. That's all. St. Louis has got a couple of days on a team. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> all right. What, what do you want me to do? Got a catcher? Yes. I'm a good catcher, too, you know. I know that. I would like to play for the St. Louis team. Well, I might arrange that. I, I would know. like to catch. Now, I'm being a good catcher. Tomorrow's pitching on the team, and I'm catching. Yes. Tomorrow throws the ball, and the guy up bunts the ball. Yes. Now, when he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out at first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, that's all you have to do. Is to throw it to first base. Yeah. Now, who's got it? Naturally. Who has it? Naturally. 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 Okay. Now you've got it. I pick up the ball and I throw it to naturally. I know you he, don't. You throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? Naturally. Okay. All right. I throw the ball to naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Well, that's it. Say it that way. That's what I said. You did not. I said I throw the ball to naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Yes. So I throw the ball to first base and naturally gets no, it. No, you throw the ball to first base. Then who gets naturally. it? Naturally. That's what I'm saying. You're not saying that. Excuse me, folks. All right, I'm sorry, friend. I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. Actually, we'll say it that way. That's what I'm saying. Don't get excited now. Don't get I excited. I throw the ball to first base and who gets it? He better get it. All right, now don't get excited. Take it easy. Hmm. Sure. Now, I throw the ball to first base, whoever it is drops the ball, so the guy runs to second. Mm -hmm. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it to, I don't know. I don't know, throws it back to tomorrow. A triple play. Yeah, it could be. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be called. Why? I don't know. He's on third, and I don't care. Over there? I said, I don't care. Oh, that's a shortstop. <laughs> This need to make the crews aware of the impact of their behavior is underscored by the cockpit voice recorders recovered from accidents. Conversations amongst the crew betray patterns which are being acted out over and over again. One of the most straightforward examples is the tragedy of Eastern Flight 401, so clearly uncomplicated by any environmental factors that it has become a classic case study. 
a dark December night in 1972, three able-bodied and experienced pilots flew an L-1011 into the Florida Everglades after becoming distracted by a burnt-out light bulb. It sounds implausible, but crew preoccupation with minor mechanical hitches and an associated failure to monitor the instruments is a common cause of accidents. This disaster also illustrates some other recurring problems, like the failure of captains to act as leaders, make decisions, set priorities and delegate responsibilities, shortcomings which are compounded by unassertive and complacent crew members. That's right. It's be a, a simulator reenactment of the final eight minutes of this flight shows how all these ordinary human failings led to a complete breakdown in teamwork and ultimately to the deaths of 99 people. Eastern 401, just turned on final. Eastern 401 heavy, continue approach to 9 left. Let's continue approach, Roger. Actual airline pilots play the parts of the ill-fated crew. The dialogue is taken from the cockpit voice recorder and altered only to remove or change expletives and names. Certain omissions have been made to shorten the elapsed time. Now I've got to try it down one more time. Eastern Flight 401 is on final approach to Miami International, runway 9 left. The nose landing gear indicator has failed to illuminate, so the crew cannot tell whether the gear is extended and locked. You want me to test the lights or not? Yeah, check it. Put your seat back. Doug, it could be light. Could you jiggle the light? It's got to come out a little and then snap in. Uh, I'll put them on. Up to 2,000. You want me to fly, Doug? What frequency did he want us on? 28.6. Uh, I'll talk to him. All right, approach control Eastern 401. We're right over the airport here and climbing to 2,000 feet. In fact, we've just reached 2,000 feet, and we've got to get a green light on our nose gear. Eastern 401, roger, turn left, heading 360, maintain 2,000, vectors to 9 left, final. Uh, left to 360. I think it's above the red one. Yeah, I can't get it from here. I can't make it pull out either. We got pressure? Yes, sir, all systems. Put the damn thing on autopilot. All right. See if you can put that light out. Now, you got to push the switch just a little bit further forward. Now, turn it to the right a little bit. No, I don't think it's going to fit. Hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel's down. Okay. You got a handkerchief or something so I can get a little better grip on this? Anything I can do with it? This damn thing just won't come out, Doug. If I had a pair of pliers, I could cushion it with that clean. The captain has neglected to divide up flying responsibilities. Everyone is absorbed by the crisis, so they don't hear the audio alert announcing a change in altitude. Okay, I'll give you the pliers. To hell with this. Go down and see if that red line is lined up down there. Don't screw around with that 20 cent piece of light equipment. Eastern 401, I'll go out west just a little further if we can here and see if we can get this light to come on. All right. Uh, the autopilot has somehow become disengaged. The plane is slowly descending and nobody is paying any attention to the altimeter. It's always something. We could have made schedule. Well, we can tell if the damn gear is down by uh, looking down at the indices. An emergency landing with a possible nose gear problem is neither very risky nor all that unusual. It's an option the captain could be preparing for now. It's got to be a faulty light. Doug, this damn thing just won't come out. All right, just leave it there. Eastern 401, how are things coming along out there? The controller's inquiry is too vague for the crew to realize he's asking about 401's surprisingly low altitude. Okay, uh, 180. We did some to the altitude here. What? Uh, we're still at 2,000, right? Hey, what's happening here? I started to become aware of a kind of a subdivision of judgment training. I gave it a name. It's called Slodge sludgy behavior, and it stands for sudden loss of judgment. My office is right underneath the NTSB, so as the accident reports come out, I just walk up one flight of stairs and, and, and get them. In most of the recent professional accidents, 
there has been this syndrome of sudden loss of judgment. What I mean by sudden is, you have a pilot with long experience, never been in trouble, revered by his colleagues, a safe, careful pilot who all of a sudden does the craziest, dumbass thing you can possibly think of. <coughs> and that's the layman's definition of sudden loss of judgment. Now, I'll very briefly talk about a couple of these. One of the saddest is one that happened right here in Dallas, and we've just gotten the report on it. It's the 1011 that went in. Um, how many of you have read that report? Okay, well, then I, I don't need to dwell on it. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable causes, and I'll just give the first cause, of the accident were the flight crew's decision to initiate and continue the approach into a cumulonimbus cloud, which they observed to contain visible lightning. Now, let's be soft for a moment. This is a 29,000-hour pilot a magnificent record, a person wh whom was looked up to by the junior people and his peers. A pilot who on that very flight had diverted in a situation that was much less acute than the one they faced here. A careful pilot. And I'll read just one more paragraph. When flight 191 turned final, the flight crew heard the AR-1 controller's broadcast to all aircraft that the shower was just north of the airport and was affecting the surface winds. And three seconds later, one of the flight crew members said that, quote, the stuff was moving in. 49 seconds later, the first officer reported that he saw lightning coming from a cloud or clouds right ahead. He, by the way, said, uh, they, uh, said it twice. The captain said, where? He said, right ahead. And 42 seconds after the rainfall intensified enough so that it could be heard on the CVR. By this time, the captain should have known that the rain was coming from a buildup or buildups above or directly in front of the airplane, that these were the buildups which produced the lightning that prompted the first officer's pirate, and that the buildup or buildups contained a thunderstorm. The captain also had to know that the, th the thunderstorm was between his airplane and the airport and, according to company policy, should be avoided. Now, this report is slightly overly simplistic, and I, I grant that. This was a good pilot. He was one of us. I mean, he was a professional in every nice sense of the word. I, as a psychologist, have to ask myself, what happened in those moments that let him go through that? And the explanation given in this report is not very satisfactory, that a pilot has to take into consideration the probabilities and, and uh, that had he landed in an alternate, they wouldn't have been able to go on with the flight. There are all kinds of explanations. I somehow feel that it's deeper and much more complex than that. So the first thing I want to say to you is really good pilots, such as you and me, can, can show this syndrome of sudden loss of judgment. As a matter of fact, the more we study it, the more it becomes visible that we are more likely to have it rather than the new and lesser experienced pilots. Talk about that in a moment. I needn't go any further for another example than this Tampa incident the other day with the Eastern Airlines pilot. I mean, the, if, if ever there was slodgy behavior, that was it. He was under pressure. He had to catch a flight. You can name all the things that led up to it, but the fact is he lost his judgment-making ability. And there was a captain with a good record, a safe captain. I heard people say after that, boy, I'm sure I don't fly around on, on his airplane, you know, his DC-9. 
He was as good as any other captain I know. He had a sudden loss of judgment syndrome, and it resulted in his death and almost resulted in the death of many, many people. The personal, one of the personal incidents I told you that affected me so deeply when I was w in the uh, Israel Air Force, a very close friend of mine took off in an F-4, just left the runway, and black smoke started to billow out of his tube. The tower told him to. Now, there's a standing order in the Israel Air Force because we value our pilots much more than we do our airplanes, much more. And especially because of the size of the country and the number of good pilots we have. That's an automatic and absolute eject out. He ejected his navigator and stayed with it to try to fix it. Blew the hell out of himself. Sudden loss of judgment. Now, a few years ago when I talked about judgment, in a group such as this, somebody got up and said, look, there's a lot of horse cocky. He said, this is just a matter of training. Well, don't you see that that's nonsense? That major in that F-4 was trained to bail out. He knew the orders. He had done it a hundred times in simulation. You couldn't train him any better. It's something deeper, something more subjective than that. Well, let me very quickly tell you what we're learning about slodge. By the way, we know very little about it now. I'll need that now. Do you want to sit there? From some of our physiological experiments, we have what's known as the accommodation syndrome. Thank you. If I put a person on a polygraph and let him just relax, he starts to get a smooth line, and then I go behind his head and go what you tend to see and this is diagrammatic is like that you wait a few seconds and you do it again a few seconds do it again until five minutes later it's kind of he's used to your clapping in back of his head we think and we have a little bit of evidence for this that what's happening to our high time pilots professional pilots, such as us all, is that we're accommodating to the pilot situation, so much so that our whole psychophysiological level of excitation is low. You can put it in terms of motivation. You can put it in terms of um, relationship with the environment. But something is happening that's not keeping us <coughs> tense and ready and wondering and worried. And it seems that in sudden loss of judgment, much of the time, this kind of accommodation syndrome is present. It's just one thing. Another may very well be what we call the performance pressure graph. And those of you who are old enough, like us, to remember the, that there were once piston airplanes, it's very much like the backside of the power curve. I mean, exactly like it, if you want to talk technical terms. If, if this is pressure, call it anxiety, call it motivation, but whatever it is, it's pressure to do well, it's level of excitation, and if this is performance, you get a curve that looks like this. The more pressure, the higher the performance. Until a precipitous drop-off point. Now this curve is very well known in psychology. has d different names. But we know that the pilot performing well is operating in this area here. If for some of the reasons, and Frank named many of them, he is over here, this results in a serious declination of judgment behavior. 
those are just those are just two of the many kinds of things we're studying that have to do with this sudden loss in judgment. There's another one that's a softer one, that's harder to understand. It has something to do with the pilot's self-concept. I can't say we have experimental data for you on this, but it certainly seems that a pilot with the self-concept that's high, he likes himself, he likes what he's doing, he's satisfied, he's more ready to admit a mistake. He's more ready to abort a landing. He's more ready to pull out and go around a thunderstorm and take a delay. It has something to do with the way he feels about himself. Again, very much the way Frank was describing it. We're going to start very soon some studies that correlate the self-concept with the self-ideal and pilot performance. So hopefully in a year or two, we'll have more data about that. One of the strange things in aviation psychology is that you can often learn more about something such as sudden loss of judgment by looking at the opposite, which is absolute perfection in pilot performance. Perfection in making good judgments. I have a tape. It's just a 13-minute tape, and that'll end my presentation. It's an exciting tape. It shows good judgment on the part of several participants in this tape. Some of you may have heard it. I, I played it once to the uh, NBAA. I'll, I'll give you the scenario, and then we'll turn it on. A twin beach, commercial pilot, takes off with two passengers from Long Island, gets up to 19,000 feet, and then all hell breaks loose. Remember, he's right over the New York metropolitan area. Got an emergency. We lost something. Who's declaring an emergency now? Over. Aircraft declaring an emergency. Say again. One Bravo Echo. We're going into a dock. Okay, one Bravo Echo, Roger. I'm on the 15 line. That one Bravo Echo you gave me has lost something. He's going into a dive. Okay, check. I'll tell Billy. All right, watch below, man. Can you read me? Over. One Bravo Echo. I hear you loud and clear. I got the traffic underneath you out of the way. Uh, how, do you have the aircraft? Uh, do you have it? Uh, do you have control of it? Uh, yeah, look, I'll uh, back up the line without a quarter of the mine's gone out. Okay, sir. Turn uh, right. I notice you're heading northeast now. I'm going to give you a vector back to uh, Kennedy. Uh, we seem to lost uh, flight stability here. All right, 821 Bravo Echo. Can you turn your aircraft at all to the right? Bravo, Kennedy on 15, Robert Bravo Echo. I don't know if I can. It seems, it, it seems really uh, difficult. I'm just trying to get the speed under control right now. Um, it seems to want to roll right. Something snapped on us. Can you get us at the VFR? Well, I don't know where there's VFR at, sir. We're pulling all kinds of vertical and positive Gs. My indicators are going bananas. All right, I can imagine that, sir. I show you in a climb. Oh, right, 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 I show you climbing, and I show you climbing very rapidly, a lot more than you were, and I'm watching your airspeed. It's picking up also, if that's any help to you. I show you going about 19,000 feet. You were climbing very slow before. I'm watching your speed. You've picked up 30 to 35 knots on the speed. How can I be climbing and picking up speed? I'm just telling you what I have here, sir. I'm telling you what I have, so you can use what you have to work with. I'm also watching you. You've been making a right, slowly banked right turn. You're heading right now about 150 degrees. Your speed is about 140. Previous to this, prior to this, you were climbing at uh, about 100 knots. They're on a plane. They're diving, they're spinning, they're doing everything. McGuire is just uh, 12 o'clock in position. You can, uh, are you, you don't know whether you're descending or climbing? My airspeed's bleeding off. I'm climbing now, but I didn't do anything with the wheel. It keeps vacillating back and forth. I must have lost my elevator. Okay, sir. Okay. Wait a minute, we're done. Try the trim from NASA 955. Try to control the trim. 8 to 1 Bravo Echo, try to control your trim. Try to control the trim, sir. 
Just for your information, he dove 10,000 feet in 36 seconds. We measured it. Yeah. Hey, guys. Get your opposite rudder, B. Bravo Echo, if you can, look at the ball and step on the uh, rudder. I got it. Good boy. We keep going up and down. We're still... Can you feel this? Try to control your nose with your, your power. Try to control your nose with your power. 821 Bravo Echo, try to control your nose with your power. Try to control the nose of the aircraft with your power. Okay, dampen out the oscillations. When the nose goes up, pull a little power, and then when it comes back down... Dive it out, Shaggy! Good power! I want you to dive it now. Just go ahead and pull a little power, and then try to dampen the oscillations out. Indicator should be diving, but I'm... Okay, now you know that the VSI is going to lag on you a little bit, so don't uh, don't get carried away. Just try to dampen it out a little bit. I'm just trying to keep it level, man. I, I can't believe my indicators. They keep going up and down real fast. What are you showing me doing, diving? Okay, if your airspeed's increasing, you're diving. I know. Try to keep your airspeed, if you can, constant, and try to keep uh, that ball in the center. Try to keep your ball in the center. Okay, wings level, ball in the center, airspeed constant. Hyperventilate. Do, do you have electric trim? Yes, I do. Okay, once you get it stabilized, just try to trim it out. What's the ceiling down here? Give me the weather down the block. 8 to 1 Bravo Echo, I show you at 5,700 feet. I'm checking on the weather. One Bravo Echo, New York. I show you leveling at about 6,000 feet. I show your airspeed 200, and I show you heading northeastbound. We're heading 260, right. Get me out of this goddamn weather. Well, I'm doing the best I can, sir. I have no indication where the layer is at at all. Just take it easy. If you have it, looks like you have it pretty well under control now. How does it seem to you? I'm fighting it, baby. I'm trying to keep wings level and airspeed constant and working with the rudder. Okay, it looks pretty good now. I show you leveling off at 6,000. Uh, I'm looking at. Uh, the weather I have here shows like it's a 900 layer at uh, 900 feet, so it looks like we're going to have to go down quite far before you get into uh, underneath it. What does the weather look like out over the water? Uh, I get the weather over the water. Can you switch to the common IFR room on 124.75 and they'll possibly be able to help you out a little bit more? This is Delta B. We're with you, Hoss. Hang on there. Just don't panic. Uh, try to keep it calm. I got you. I'm gonna try to keep it calm, buddy. Go with. I got it. You got it all right now, Bravo Echo. Well, I'm trying to keep it calm, but man, I want to get down so that I can taste it. And I can understand that. I got no problems at all with that. The common eye is aware of your problem, and uh, that's their frequency, 124.75, and we're going to try to get you down below this overcast and this measured ceiling of 900 feet. I'm switching 124.75. Now, who was helping uh, Bravo Echo the most there? Uh, there was, I was listening to him. Delta 623, I hope we weren't cutting you out. 623, Roger. Turn left to a heading of uh, 180. No, you aren't hurting, man. So, 180, and I'm going to bring this, bring you back around to the left. Do you have two uh, transmitters there? Yes, sir. We're going back to 2475 also. All right, that's fine. Go back to 12475, fly heading of 180, and uh, they'll be waiting for you. All right, we're really sending you too. He wants to get down so bad he can taste it. He's really shook. All right, just hand him over to me. I'll Here take he comes. care of him. New York, Duke, 821 Bravo Echo. 821 Bravo Echo, New York approach. How do you reach us? Loud and clear. 821 Bravo Echo, turn 20 degrees to your right. Maintain your present altitude. What's the heading again? Would you give me a number, please? I'm spinning around. All right, try to fly heading was uh, 130. 130 heading. 130. Hey, this is Delta. We still reach up here. How you doing, Hoss? Hang in there. 
take a couple of deep breaths. Keep it in the center if you can. 821 Bravo Echo, stop your turn. Right. If it starts dropping off, try to get your nose over if you can. Uh, is it controllable for you now? I'm working with it, buddy. I only got $600, but I tell you, we would spit. I'm trying to save it. Uh, who is talking to one Bravo Echo besides Kennedy Approach? Let's tell with 623, sir. Uh, 8221 Bravo Echo to Kennedy Weather is 1,300 scattered, estimated ceiling 3,500 over test, visibility 5 with rain and fog. Going to take into the airport to land runway 4, right or left. The winds are 360 at 1-5. Okay, I think I've lost my uh, compasses and stuff here or whatever, but anyway, you're going to give me radar vectors all the way, right? 821 Bravo Echo, absolutely. Just continue your left time. I'll give you radar vectors right to the airport. We'll get you out of this weather here shortly. It's nice, easy T to 4,000 for the moment. A 821 Bravo Echo, Kennedy altimeter 2985. Descend and maintain 3,000. A 21 Bravo Echo, you read? Yes, I come down to 3,000. Okay, Bravo Echo, now uh, turn to the start of a turn to the right now. I need you to about 20 degrees right. Just start a right turn now, and I'll tell you when to stop. It'll be very shortly. Turning right. Yeah, 821 Bravo Echo, you have any uh, instruments on board for an ILS approach, or you just want to take a right off exit to the airport? Well, I got an ILS instrumentation, but I'd rather you just steer me in, I think. I don't, I don't trust these instruments right now. 821 Bravo Echo, roger. We'll vector you to the airport. Descend and maintain 2000. Maintain your present heading. Still IFR. 821 Bravo Echo, roger. What are your flight conditions at this moment, sir? Forward visibility, sir. IFR. Still IFR, okay. Hang in there, Hollis. You're doing great. One Bravo Echo reading 2,000 feet. Bravo Echo, Roger. Maintain two. I want to get you steady on a heading to the airport again, and then we'll start you down. What uh, heading are you going through on your instruments? 30031. It's jumping. Okay, sir. One Bravo Echo, Roger. Descended, maintain 1,500. At a 19 for 15. Bravo Echo, altimeter still 2985. 85. And one Bravo Echo, what are your flight conditions now? Uh, still IFR. Hey, local. Yeah. What's it look like out to the southwest? Uh, hazy and misty, but not too bad. Is he in clouds at the point? Yeah, at the moment, check. Uh, bottom should, down a little bit. He shouldn't break out by the shoreline. Check, have his... One, two, Bravo, Echo, turn left now. Left. Okay, we're seeing the uh, a coastline coming up. One Bravo Echo, Roger, stop turn. Okay, uh, 821 Bravo Echo, 1230 and 5 miles. You should see the runway lights. They're up to step 4 as you get a little closer to the airport. You might see them breaking out now. Not yet, but we're looking. Hey, Bravo Echo, maintain your present altitude. I'll show you at 900 feet. Is that correct? Affirmative. Roger. Coming down, uh, we're going to have to land without the flaps because they're, uh, uh, I'm afraid they might interfere with the elevator. Remember that. 821 Bravo Echo, Roger. It's a very long runway, your runway full left. Uh, tower knows you're coming in. You'll remain on this frequency until you touch now. We'll change you over after landing. Roger. Coming down at 500. Bravo Echo, Roger. Okay, I see two runways. Put me on the left side. 821 Bravo Echo, Roger, runway inside, clear to land, runway four left, completion of landing roll, contact the tower on 119.1. 191. Bravo Echo. Hi, Loco. He's got it, he's landing, I told him completion of landing roll, come over to you. Okay, 921. New York, Delta 623. Delta 623, New York, departure. We were following uh, progress of an uh, airplane in trouble back up in New York. Uh, uh, it must be the same frequency. Just wonder if he made it in all right. So he's on a short final now at Kennedy, and it looks like everything's going to work out okay. You guys did a great job. We were listening to you. Outstanding. Thank you very much, sir. In New York, you can give uh, Delta 623 a call when that airplane is on the ground up there. Appreciate it. And Delta 623, the aircraft has uh, touched down now. 
Fantastic. See you later. My time is up. Let me briefly go over just two or three things, and then I've got to quit. One is uh, everybody wants to know what really happened. What really happened is that an aileron broke loose and it was hanging. So every time he'd go up, this thing go down, everything went down, this thing go up. Uh, he had very little control of the aircraft. Our, uh, our engineers tell us that had he put his flaps down, he was a dead duck. Would have gone right in. Now, here was a relatively new pilot, 600 hours, who we would have said, because of the pressure, everything else would have gone through the exact uh, um, pre-landing sequence and put his gear down and put his flaps on everything in a rigid way. He didn't do it. He saved his life and those of his passengers. Uh, now, it's easy to say, well, leave well enough alone. Anybody would have done that. But the fact is, the more pressure you're under, the more you tend to do the routine. And he didn't. So that was one great judgment. The most important judgment that was made was by the Delta pilot. Do you know that without permission, he just started to go around. He obviously knew he was, or thought that he was in okay area, but he wouldn't leave the guy, and he didn't have time to, to call in. They lost 623. <laughs> they didn't quite know where he was. You remember when then they said, well, who's been helping him, and where are you? And they kind of brought him back into the, into the IFR uh, sequence. But uh, there is no question in our minds that that Delta guy saved his life. The whole tone of it, did you, you, did you get that? That's right. And that was a judgment call. Here was a professional pilot doing exactly what he should not do. And he did it. And it was a good judgment. Now, there are lots of other judgments, the vectoring and so on. I don't have time to talk about it. But you see, we learn a lot from good judgments. And when we compare them to things like accommodation and to the pressure performance curve, we learn a lot about poor judgments. The last thing I'd like to say is this tape shows me why I'm so proud to be one of you. This shows aviation and the people in it at its very best. Thanks. On January 20th, 1981, a Beach 99A crashed during an instrument approach into Spokane International Airport. The aircraft, flying below minimum descent altitude, hit a hill about four and a half miles from the runway. The NTSB determined that the probable cause of the accident was a premature descent to MDA, based on the use of an incorrect DME frequency. It's believed that the aircraft's DME mode selector was probably in the hold position until right before the crash, and that the mileage displayed was from the Spokane Vortac rather than the runway localizer and DME frequency. Both pilot and co-pilot were well qualified and type rated with Beach 99A experience of over 7,000 and 3,000 hours respectively. As with many accidents, this competent, experienced flight crew overlooked one simple task. They, along with their passengers, died as a result. It would be very easy for us to say that this accident simply should never have happened. But when you stop to think about it, no accident should ever happen. So instead of looking for easy answers, let's take a long look at some underlying questions. How can a pilot neglect a common, simple procedure how does this malfunction of the human system occur? And most important, what can we do to avoid this type of situation? As for the beach accident, the exact cause will never be known. But included in the NTSB report was a statement that the flight crew could have been distracted by a gear warning horn and light, going off at a time when they should have been positioning the DME mode selector. All of us are subject to fatigue and distraction. And like everyone else, we're limited in our ability to think and deal with more than one thing at a time. Psychologists tell us that as we initiate a common procedure, such as changing a selector mode, we do it first in our minds. If we're distracted in the process, we may have mentally checked it off our list, even though we never complete the task. The accident report indicated that the plane's landing gear was down, and it appeared that the landing checklist had been completed. 
we asked Professor Mason about the use and misuse of the checklist. But it's very possible for any person, the most intelligent, the most astute person, to forget one out of two items at any time. And so even if it's a two-item checklist, it should be used to verify that these eventualities won't occur. Uh, a lot of people don't like to. They think it's some deficiency in the human system that they have to use it. Well, I'll go along with them. There is a deficiency in the human system. We can't remember more than one thing at a time. Whenever you use a checklist, you not only use every item, but you say it out loud. When you say something out loud, that involves all the consciousness. You look at the item concern uh, at the gear, at the uh, at the pressure, at the temperature gauge, things like that. At the approach slope indicator, you look at them and you also touch them. Uh, thus forcing yourself to pay attention. So you say, you look, and you touch each item concern. Now that takes more time than a lot of people have. And this is one of the things where the pilot has to learn to take that time. He has to, say, and he has to learn to say, this is my airplane, I'm going to damn well do it right. And so I'm going to take the time to say, look and touch, and if the controller uh, thinks I'm a little slow in a pattern, well, okay, we'll bust out and we'll take another approach, and so on. And in fact, this is a lot of cause of accident. The pilot getting overrushed by somebody else pushing him. Another possible factor included in the NTSB report centered around statements indicating that on the day of the accident, the flight crew was not performing at expected levels of proficiency. Other airline employees said that the captain had complained of having a bad day, including problems with his motorcycle and poor performance on the racquetball court. Any professional pilot can tell you, you shouldn't bring personal problems into the cockpit. If they're honest, they'll also add, it's nearly impossible not to. From major family and financial problems to insignificant little hassles like spilling coffee on our tie, these situations create a form of emotional stress. As trivial as they may seem to other people, our problems tend to take on greater proportion and undoubtedly affect our performance. Stress, for instance, makes remarkable changes in a person. There's some 79 physical changes alone in the body. Uh, the heart beats faster, the breathing is faster, perspiration is more, uh, things like that. But more important to the pilot, uh, his coordination has changed. And when the pilot reaches for a switch, and he's under, say, pressure of time, or pressure because somebody at a meeting gave him a bad time, or because he had a fight with a wife, uh, when he reaches for a switch, he will tend to overreach. Uh, when he goes to dial in a new frequency on the radio, he'll tend to turn the uh, radio selector beyond where he meant to because he has more strength and more strength than he realizes. When he rolls a wheel into a turn, he'll tend to go a few, beyond, a few degrees beyond where he intended to turn. Uh, when he dumps the wheel in a stall, he'll tend to dump it too far, and this is where people got themselves into progressive stalls uh, because of the fact that any stress tends to increase strength and decrease a person's perception of time. When people are stressed, their eye movement is reduced markedly. They tend to fixate their attention toward what they were looking at or toward the thing they think is important, and there's less eye movement. And another important feature is there's less peripheral vision. For instance, uh, if I'm, say, concentrating on a typing job and I'm under pressure, I don't see things out here as readily. So consequently, uh, when I'm reaching out here for a piece of paper, I get my hand on the stapler. Uh, the same thing in the cockpit, that uh, when the pilot is concentrating on approach slope indicator, when he's concentrating on that traffic out there, uh, he has less peripheral vision, and so consequently, he may not see, may not see this traffic out here. Uh, so in fact, knowing that, the pilot who is under pressure has to learn to use his eyes more, even though the eyes will want to move less, and the eyes will get more tired if he does try to move them but still he has to do it. Happiness is related to under control, and in fact, there have been several accidents where the pilot was just absolutely ecstatic about his pay raise, about his new airplane, about his new baby, things like that, where he's taxied over a fire truck, uh, <laughs> taxied into another airplane, uh, let the airplane get way beyond him in the flight, and things like that, because again, the time sense is affected here. Now, when we're happy, time goes whizzing by, and so we arrive at our checkpoint long before we thought we should, or we forget to do all the items of the checklist uh, because it seems like it's finished. And so that uh, both emotional states, happiness and unhappiness, if they are brought into the cockpit, uh, can be a disaster.
Where the mistakes come from depends on the exact nature of the job a flight crew has to do when this cockpit is at 30,000 feet. They can't look out of the window to help them decide where they are. So they depend entirely on secondary information gleaned from these instruments. The flight director with its artificial horizon, the altimeter, speed indicators and so on. And they use this information to pull together a mental map or model of where they are and what their aeroplane is doing in three-dimensional space and time. The trouble is, being human, they sometimes stick doggedly to their model even when those instruments subsequently start screaming at them that they've got it wrong. There was a famous incident which occurred at Nairobi in which a 747 with three crew members on board was approaching and the air traffic controller gave them an altitude which he cleared them down to and what he said was that they were cleared to 7500 feet, that's 7,500 feet. But the seven was rather quietly spoken and so they simply failed to perceive that seven so that all that went into their ears was five with two zeros after it. Now at the stage of flight that they were at, five with two zeros after it didn't make sense. 500 feet was not a sensible altitude for them to let down to and it was, would have jarred with any model that they'd had of what they were doing. So that they didn't actually think to themselves, ah, that must have been five with three zeros after it, but all of them believed that they had heard five zero zero zero. That's to say 5,000 feet, because that would have been a sensible altitude for them to have been cleared to at that stage in the flight. But unfortunately, at Nairobi, the actual altitude of the ground above the sea is 5,300 and something feet, so that they were actually motoring down in this 747 to a subterranean approach altitude where even big Boeings aren't designed to go. Of course, also being a good aeroplane, the 747 started to try to tell them that things weren't right. That's to say, warnings began to appear that they were too far below the glide slope. But because these warnings didn't fit in with their model, they chose to believe that the warnings were spurious warnings rather than they had made the wrong model. And in fact, it's interesting to note here that they eventually broke cloud just about 200 feet above the ground. And when they were confronted with natural cues from the world, as we were talking about before, they were able to make an accurate model instantly, put the power on, overshoot, and uh, the passengers never knew that anything had happened. On another occasion, the real world didn't intervene in time. This Boeing 707 was approaching Bali, Indonesia from the north. They planned their approach by tuning into a so-called non-directional beacon situated on the airfield at the south of the island. Shortly afterwards, the needle of the receiving instrument appeared to swing through a full 180 degrees. The captain concluded that he had literally crossed the radio dead space right above the beacon. In other words, he'd arrived. So he planned the standard approach into the airport. But he wasn't here at all. He was up here, over 20 miles to the north. And as he flew the standard approach, he flew straight into a mountain. NDBs are notoriously unreliable. In fact, this is what he was seeing, the needle chuntering about due to local interference. It wasn't showing him he was over the airport at all. For the entire 30 minutes for which we have cockpit voice recorder transcript, there were multiple and repeated references by various crew members to the apparent unreliability of the navigational signals that they were receiving from the beacon. There's repeated reference to the terrain in the area, there was repeated reference to the differences in indications between the number one and number two needles. And uh, furthermore, no one raised the very important question as to how it was that they had managed to arrive, supposedly arrive at the station, a full 10 minutes ahead of their original estimated time of arrival. Here was a situation where a crew were faced with ambiguous and unreliable information. They recognized it, they were uncomfortable with it, but they did nothing to positively resolve the ambiguities, and the, the accident is a direct result of that failure to resolve those ambiguities. Early in 
1982, a disaster occurred which suggested that all these influences had converged to strain the system to breaking point. Even more shocking to an industry normally preoccupied with nuts and bolts was the attention this accident focused on human beings. Air Florida was indeed a crucible of human factors. It was a quintessential example of what happens in a, an airline crash, a crash of any sort, when there's nothing wrong with the airplane. It's all a chain of human failures that led to that accident. January 13th, 1982. At 4.01 on that snowy afternoon, Air Florida Flight 90 was at the bottom of the Washington, D.C. Potomac River. The rescue drama was about to be played out in real time on live television. The Boeing 737 had collided with the 14th Street Bridge shortly after takeoff from National Airport on its way to Fort Lauderdale. Four people lay dead on the bridge, and America watched in disbelief as helicopters hovered over the river searching for survivors. Only five people were pulled out of the water alive. Safety board accident investigator Rudy Capustin was on his way home when the news broke. Just as we got ready to go in the elevator, somebody came out and said, the airplane just hit the 14th Street Bridge. And, and it just didn't sink in for some reason to none of us that this was a big airplane. My response was, uh, what the hell is a little airplane doing flying on a day like this? A major snowstorm had closed National Airport, and the Air Florida 737 was held at the gate for two hours, waiting for snowplows to clear the way to the ramp. At 3.58 p.m., the sound of laughter was heard in the cockpit as Flight 90 was being cleared for takeoff. Less than three minutes later, at 4.01, First Officer Roger Pettit tells Captain Larry Wheaton they are going down. One second later, the sound of impact ended the transmission. Seven days later, the cockpit voice recorder was dredged up from the river. Its grisly testimony helped explain the mystery of why the plane had been able to leave the runway, but without enough clearance to miss the bridge. On the Air Florida cockpit voice recorder, we became aware that, uh, that uh, something just wasn't quite right uh, with the engines. Paul Turner is the safety board laboratory technician responsible for analyzing the cockpit voice recorder. We all had this, uh, this funny feeling about it not having enough power on it. So I brought the tape into the, uh, into the laboratory in the other room and I ran an uh, uh, analysis on it, a spectrum analyzer on the tape and was looking at the, uh, at the engine sounds. And it became apparent that when he ran his stand-up check with the throttles and, and he pushed the throttles forward and he, uh, and he checked his engines out and then we should have seen an increase in the engine power and the engine should have gone up and they didn't. They, were, they just barely rose if at all and then they were stabilized at that particular EPR setting, which is uh, how you set this engine, engine pressure ratio. The next test confirmed the idea that the crew had tried to take off with only three quarters of the necessary engine power. Boeing experts later confirmed Turner's hunch that this was due to an ice-blocked pressure duct. This, in turn, had created a misleadingly high indication of the engine pressure ratio. The first officer could see from the other gauges that something was wrong, but the captain paid no attention. Determining why the duct was blocked raised the question of whether the engine de-ice was on. We went through the, uh, the portion of the checklist in which the captain uh, reads or the captain re replies to the co-pilot uh, as to whether the uh, de-icing system is on or off. He said anti-ice, the answer would be on or off. And uh, it's, those two words are sometimes difficult to differentiate in the cockpit with all the other noises on. And the, uh, the group was actually divided in this particular case. And uh, clearly, uh, the response was off. And because uh, everybody that listened to it, uh, including the people that had no, uh, no reason to be uh, partial towards the investigation, uh, our own people couldn't believe it. 
And of course, the Air Florida people didn't want to believe it. Uh, pilot group didn't want to believe it. That uh, this, the response was off. Failure to turn on the engine de-ice in the middle of a freezing snowstorm was only one of the cold weather protocols flouted by this crew. They also ignored other de-icing procedures and knowingly took off with snow and ice on their wings. Patricia Felch, one of only five survivors, later recalled her concern during testimony at the accident hearings. I remember the last de-icing was about 3.15. And I remember we took off about between 5 of and 4 o'clock. I turned to my boss and said, they're going to have to de-ice us again. And when they came back to the right side, I turned and said, see? And he just laughed. But they never came back to the left side of the plane. Seven months later, the National Transportation Safety Board report implicated the controllers for the long delay between de-icing and departure clearance and the plane's design for a winter performance defect. But chief blame for the accident was placed on the Air Florida crew for three different counts of faulty judgment before and during takeoff. the sound barrier in level flight will be more than a spectacular feat. It will also give the Air Force valuable knowledge of the resources of new propulsive systems. Captain Yeager gets aboard the XS-1 